Hi everyone and welcome to the portal. Today we are taking part in the Big Draw Festival, which is the world's biggest community of drawing enthusiasts. My name is Leila Bumbra and I am the program manager for the research forum here at the portal. And I am so excited to have you all here today for this Big Draw Festival, which is called Make the Change. Many of you will have been at our Big Draw Festival last year, which looked at environments and habitats, animals and plants. But in 2021, the Big Draw team has asked us to go one step further, to take action, to explore, and to discover ways to live in balance with the world around us. And after a bit of housekeeping, which is more of the boring stuff, sorry, we will kick off the day with some workshops, reworking the Courtauld collection to focus on protest art, sustainable art practices and ideal and imaginary worlds. The second half of the day will allow rare um, up close and personal object study sessions. In these sessions, Courtauld experts will look to artists in our collection, artists who have reused paper, produced double-sided drawings and cut out replaced areas and drew over previous works. We will pop the link into the chat so you can see the schedule just now as well. And you can drop in and out of the session with the link that you've been sent and take part in whatever you want today. There's also information here about what materials you will need to take part in each session. We'll be putting this in the chat every 20 minutes or so. So today we are lucky to have artists, creators, makers and experts, Helen Kahn, Michelle Reeder, Amber Butler and the Courtauld Prints and Drawings team, Katie Cotardo and Rachel Stone with us for this online festival. And we are inviting you and your family to explore and get creative with materials you can find in your own home, garden and local area to reconnect with each other and demand a better world for future generations. So just a reminder that the first two workshops are suitable for anyone over seven years old who is interested in reusing and recycling, making and drawing. The third workshop is aimed at those a little bit older, so anyone who's 12 years plus. And the object study part of the event is designed for older art enthusiasts, granting an opportunity to pose your questions to our experts of works on paper in our collection. So please remember as well that all children should be supervised by an adult at all times while taking part as we don't want any accidents. We also really want to see everything that you've made today. We are on at Court of Res on social media, or you can also send your creations to us at, um, on email at researchforum at courtauld.ac.uk. I would also love to know where you are just now, where are you zooming in from? So do put that in the chat for us as well. Okay, so that's probably enough from me. Let's get started. I am so happy to introduce you all to the wonderful Amber. Amber Butler is an illustrator, artist, activist, and recent graduate working in Luton. She would describe her work as punk, punchy, and expressive. She mostly uses ink, spray paint, acrylic, and pastel. She starts off physically working mostly on newsprint and scrap paper, then brings together everything digitally to complete it. Amber enjoys using art for good. She feels more inspired when there's a strong message behind the work and something she can emotionally connect with. Amber is compassionate, resilient, and her work is driven by fighting injustice. She will always stand for what is right, so she's absolutely perfect to kick off today's Big Draw Festival. Today, Amber is making the change with the workshop, Be the Change, Use Your Voice. And I hope you're all ready to start making positive protest posters with Amber just now. So please do go and get your materials ready uh, with the list that we've just sent round. Amber, thank you for being here today. If it's okay, I will pass it over to you to get started. So hello everyone. I know you can't see me right now. I had to get the perfect angle so you could see what we'd be working on today. Um, welcome to my workshop. Um, so this is the Be The Change, Use Your Voice workshop. Um, we're gonna be doing some protest posters today. So it's like protest posters, but then also like kind of positivity posters. Um, so I hope everyone's got what they need. I'll be using some A3 paper. It doesn't really matter what size you use. It's whatever you're comfortable with, but I prefer to work a little bit bigger. I'll also be using my markers. So these are the markers that I use. Um, I did opt for two colors. So if you have a black and a pop of color, 
Um, then I've got the stencils here, pre-cut, one I've already been using, but I've got the stencils ready and also my spray paint. You don't have to use spray paint. You can also use your markers with your stencils as well. And I've got a fabric paint here too. So I did give um, a prompt list for today, but I do want to encourage you to use your voice. So with your posters, um, you can choose one of the prompts. You can copy me and what I'm doing, or you can write down some notes of maybe things that uh, you want to put on your poster. Um, the things that I've put is freedom for all, Black Lives Matter, equality, spread love or spread kindness, be kind, refugees welcome, together, choose love always, unity and positivity. Um, I also want it to highlight as well, it's October. So in the UK, October's Black History Month. And also on the 10th of October, I believe it's World Mental Health Day. So um, I'm going to focus on some sort of positive and encouraging quotes for my posters today. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So I did have a few ideas. Usually I work um, directly onto my paper. I don't use pencil, I don't sketch it out, I go straight in. But I'm just gonna quickly sketch out an idea of what I wanna do for this poster. So I'm just gonna grab my pen. And I think the quote that I wanna use on this poster is, we are one. And I think I'm gonna go with a love heart in the background. I think I'll put my type sort of overlapping the heart. And often I change out some of my letters for shapes. So for my A, I'll use a triangle. And for the O for one, I'll use a love heart. And I'll probably add maybe some arrows over here or just some lines, some dots. You can get experimental. You can have a look at your stencil if you have your stencil with you, or you can think about some shapes that you might want to add just to fill the white space. I'm just going to leave that there as a guide. I'm going to start off with my love heart in the background. And I always have a bit of scrap paper just to test out my pens, just to make sure I don't make a mistake. So I'm just going to test this out. I'm going to start with my love heart. Now I tend to work in layers. So I'm going to start with the back, uh, black in the background and um, my other markers layer quite nicely over the top. I'm just going to test this one out as well. And I'm just going to figure out how I'm going to fit my text on here. I quite like it when it overlaps. So I'm just going to start with my W. And do my love heart here for one. Just about fits. I probably could have pushed it up a little bit more, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to add some lines coming off my love heart. Now I've got loads of free space up here now. So 
so I think I'm going to take my stencil and have a look what I might add to this. I think I might go maybe for an array up here, maybe both of these arrows. So I'm going to place my stencil down. Decide where you want it, but obviously I've cut out other bits and I don't want to spray those through. You can if you want, but I don't want to spray those through. So what I'm going to do is just cover those gaps. So I'll put a bit here. Just to make sure this is dry before I put the paper down so I don't want to smudge it. And we've just got a star here showing, so I'm just going to cover that up a little bit. Then I think I'm going to go in with my black spray paint. I always like to test this first as well. Some, um, Sometimes you can use different pressures. So the different pressure you apply to the top of your spray paint depends on how it comes out. So sometimes you can spray it with a lot of pressure and it'll come out with a thick black line or you can be quite light handed with it and you'll get like this nice gradient effect. I think that's what I'm gonna try and do. I'm just gonna make sure it works. I'm gonna try and get the gradient effect. So just try and press really lightly on the top. I don't know if you can see from there, but it kind of has this paint splatter effect. Take those off gently. I definitely feel like I can add some more to this to fill up the white space. And I think I might actually go for some more arrows on this side, but I'm not sure which one to go for. Um, I think maybe I'll try this arrow. If you don't have the stencil, feel free to just draw some arrows or some shapes just to fill in the white space. Or you can leave it blank if you want. It just depends how you like, how you'd like your poster to look. Now I like mine to look quite full. Just cover this bit. So this time, I think I'm going to try and go for a thick black line. I could be able to see the difference with the arrows. Uh, when you do the spray paint, you don't have to hold the cone, the cone, <laughs> the spray pan, sorry, that close. Otherwise, you'll end up making your paper quite soggy and you'll overspray it. So you don't actually need to be that heavy handed with the spray paint. So I'm happy with that. Do you think I wanna add maybe a little bit more? Um, fast stencil again. I think I might go in with my, one of my other markers. Now all of these have different nib sizes. This one's more of like a rounded shape. And I sometimes use this just to make some dots. So I think I might add some dots maybe around here. Just quickly test it. And might just do some here. Feel free to add some lines or shapes or triangles, squares, stars, crosses, whatever you want just to fill up the space. And I think I'm happy with that now. We are one. So that's the first poster done. Hopefully we should have some time to do about three more posters. I'm gonna head on to the next one now. Get rid of this. So 
So for this one, I think I want to do a landscape piece actually. So feel free to turn your paper. It doesn't just have to be portrait. You can do landscape depending on how you want your piece to fit on the paper. I think I want to uh, go with the word equality for this piece. Um, I think I'll have that. Now your word doesn't always have to fit in one straight line. I sometimes try to fit it all in in like a wonky way. So I think I'll go for something like that. And then same again, I'll probably try and add some beautiful shapes in there and lines, maybe a lot or something over here. Maybe some arrows. Maybe try and go for something like that, I think. And then maybe I'll add something inside the A for equality. So I'm going to keep that there for a reference. But again, we're going to go straight in with our pens. We're going to be brave. We're not going to sketch it out. We're going to go straight in. So I'm just going to grab my large pen again. Make sure it works. I'll try and stick my E across here. Now I'm going to use the bigger one this time, but I'm going to go in first with the small one because I often have a habit of being a bit too heavy handed with that pen and then it ends up becoming a big blob. So I'm going to start, put it here. So don't be afraid to overlap your letters. You can still read it. Sometimes you have to layer things just to make sure you can fit it in, but also it's just a nice, it's a nice layout. So I'm happy with that, but I'm gonna go in with my bigger one. I just like the contrast of the different thicknesses of the line. So I think I'm gonna have these ones thicker up here, and then I'm gonna leave these ones with the thinner line. So next, I think it's time to embellish it a bit with some of these shapes. What do you think I should use? Definitely want to put a heart in here. I'm not sure what I'll go for yet. I think maybe so we've got two hearts here. We've got the one which has the little wings or we've just got this heart. So I think I might go for this one. So same again, I'm just gonna figure out where I want it. Hold my paper there. Grab my scrap pieces of paper just to cover up these pieces. Let's get this way that way. Just need to be a little bit careful of that bit because it still looks slightly wet. Of course, um, so I use Molito. I came across these recently. They're a bit like Poscas, but you can get them in uh, way more different sizes, I believe. So they do, this is called the drip stick. So this is like the thick, the thick ones, or you've got, these which are just markers but you can get them in all different sizes you can get tiny ones or you can get thick ones but I really like the thick ones I love it. 
this. And that's still on the list with it wet. But another thing I like about these is that they layer really, really nicely, but you can't really get that effect with other markers. And also they, they do dry quickly as well. So I think I'm gonna use my pink for that. I'm just gonna go in with this neon pink. And again, just gonna quickly check that the colors mix properly. I haven't covered that bit there. Quickly cover that. So I want quite a bold color with that. So I sprayed using quite a heavy pressure because you have to remember it is going on top of the black, so you do have to make sure it is sprayed well. I think I wanna add some arrows to this as well. I think I might use this arrow. I think, again, I'll go in with the black and try and go for that gradient effect again. Because it sometimes just looks like you're using all these different materials when actually you're not using that much you're just using it in different ways and the spray paint dries really quickly as well so i can just cover that So either you can leave it like that, or again, you know, I like to fill up my blank space. I'm definitely going to add just some more into here. So I think I might go for some dots. Just do some dots here. So again, same with these, depending on the pressure you give it, you can get these sort of splatters. I think I want to add maybe some pink lines in there somewhere. Let's just check that works. Um, I think maybe over here. Like I said, it is nice to overlap the colors. You can see I've slightly overlapped there. It gives a nice effect. Um, I think definitely want to add something else into this. It's going to look back at my stencil again. So there's some arrows on this one that I like. Or maybe a star, I think I might go with the star. And maybe put some stars along the top. What do you think? Down here? Let's do one down here first. I think I'll go for one maybe there. Um, I think I'll go with a black star. Yep, I'm happy with that. I'm definitely going to add some more stars. I think maybe black and a pink one up here. Maybe down the side, actually. I'm gonna go for down the side. Just cover that bit. Okay. Maybe I'll do this one a little bit wonky like that.
Again, if you um, don't have any spray paint, you do have the stencil, you can just use your pen. Maybe I'll try and do one with the pen over here. Maybe I'll do one here. Go in with the black. Hope you relax this in. You might be too thick. But we'll just go with it anyways. The pen is slightly thick, but it doesn't matter. Definitely want to add a bit more pink to that, so I might actually just go straight in with the pen. So just add some little lines up here, I think. I think I'm happy with that now. Is that your second poster done? So I'm going to grab my paper again. I think I might go back to portrait this time. Now, one of my favorite quotes is be kind. And it's so simple yet, it's so important. And I think it's really important that we're kind to everyone, no matter what. Um, quickly sketch out something here. So I'm going to start with a big smiley face in the middle and I'm going to give my smiley face some lovely heart eyes because they're filled with love and kindness. Then I'll go for a B kind like there. Probably give it some lines and dots. So again, feel free to copy me, but also feel free to go with your own quotes and your own themes. Use the prompt list. Think about what's important to you. You know, what you want to tell people that you love and care about. Maybe you can dedicate one of your posters to one of your friends or your mum. Or your dad. So I'm gonna start off now. I think I'm gonna use my pink marker. And I need to draw a circle. And this is, isn't always easy to get a perfect circle. And I'm probably not gonna get a perfect circle, but I usually have to move with the pen. That's good enough for me. <laughs> so let's go in for the eyes. I tend to use the smaller one for this. And then the big smiley face to finish. some lines down here too. Now again, I'm just working on layers again. So I like to start with the, the main image in the background and then I put the text on the top because if I start with the text and you're trying to do things separately, you might start squishing your work and not giving yourself enough space. And as I said before, I like layering. It's always nice to layer your work. So I'm gonna start with that. I'm going to add my text over the top, just making sure my pen was working. I need to try and make sure I can fit my kind in as well, so hopefully it does. And I'm going to 
going to try and curve it around slightly just to go along with my big smiley face. I think I might add some love hearts to this one, but I actually really like this the way it is, so I don't want to add too much to it. But I think I'm going to go with a heart and maybe star. I'm going to grab this one because I think I might use this heart. I don't think we've used this one yet. I'm going to go with this one. I think I want to put one maybe here, maybe that side. I'm just going to figure out where I want to put it, look at my piece, and then decide. So I think I want it here. I'm going to lay that down, grab my scrap pieces of paper again, just to do the same process to make sure we don't spray anything extra on here that we don't want. Now, you might not actually want to cover up these pieces, you might like having some of the other shapes slowly creeping in. So you can go for it and give it a try if you want. Sometimes you can, you know, spray the line of the paper. That sometimes looks quite nice. But I don't think I want to do that today. I think I'm just going to cover it. I think I'm going to go with the black. Slowly. Then I'm definitely going to add a heart here and maybe some stars around here, I think. So line that up again. Maybe I'll actually go back to using this heart. So I'm going to decide where I want it. And I think I kind of want it to slightly overlap the B a little bit. So I think I'll put my heart here. My hand there. Yeah, I like that. I think I might try out these dots because we haven't tried that yet. So I think I might put on my other stencil. I might put in some of these dots here, maybe. So I think I might go for some dots at the bottom, actually. Gonna spray those. I think I'm gonna leave it at that because I quite like this design. It's nice and simple. Sometimes it's more powerful just to keep your piece uh, stripped back. Focus on the message. We'll cover that. Perfect. Now, with these as well, if you did uh, keep any of your offcuts from your stencil, you can still use these as a stencil. It kind of does the opposite effect. So instead of getting the shape, you can get sort of the outline. So I might actually try and show you how these might work. I might use an arrow and just show you how you can still use the offcuts. So I might. Do something like this. 
it just gives a slightly different effect. I'm worried they might move a little bit, so I'm just going to quickly grab some masking tape. My masking tape isn't very strong, so this won't ruin my paper. So I'll just kind of get rid of the tackiness slightly. Just gonna put this underneath just to hold it down ever so slightly so I don't want it to move. And the same again with the other arrow. So ever so slightly, I don't want to overspray. If you take those up now, you still get the shape of the arrow. It's like negative space. So that still works really nicely as well. Is your third poster done? How are we doing for time, um, Layla? You have still another five to 10 minutes, Amber, so you're doing well. <laughs> okay, perfect, thank you. So if we do one more post in, I think we've got time for. So grab your next piece of paper. And for this one, I'm gonna go with the phrase, you matter. Because we all matter and we're all special and unique in our own ways. I'm not sure if that will fit, so we might end up having to do some letters here, maybe. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Good to see your comment in the chat. So, with this one, I might. So I wanna do you matter. So I'm not sure whether I just wanna go straight in and have this one really plain and simple or add another sort of background. So I might actually draw another heart because I just love hearts. As you can notice, it's a reoccurring theme. I think I might put a heart in the background. I'll just like this. So just go straight in. a little bit taller. This pen's slightly running out, but I actually quite like the effect it gives. It looks like a brush effect. I think I'm gonna go in with the pink over the top, like our first one. Hopefully I can fit in you matter. I think we'll form. Probably start a bit further up this time. Let's probably we can fit it in if we start here. And I sometimes like to add that little dash there and just continue underneath. Now I actually like this one quite simple, but I think I will add maybe some lines just coming off at the bottom. Uh, maybe a bit line. Just make sure this is working. 
I think I do some lines here. And then maybe do you have some lines here I haven't tried out yet, just got on the arrow. These little lines here, I think I might give that a go. Well, I might even just use this arrow. Okay. Go for that actually. So yeah, I'm just gonna figure out where I want it. I what that might even look like up here. I think I actually quite like the look of it here. I definitely need something in this corner, I think. Does anyone have any suggestions on what I should do in that corner? Another one just here. Perfect. I think I'm going to keep this one simple and just keep the arrows. Is that good for time, Leila? That's perfect. Thank you, Amber. I'm just going to bring these back up. That's your four protest posters. That's your session done. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Amber. I actually can't wait to see what everyone else has made. Um, if you joined a bit later on, please do send all of your creations to us on social media at Court World Res. Amber, before you go, did you want to say your social media tags and also your website so people can get in touch with you as well and show you what they've made? Yeah, today? sure. So my website is www.amberbutler.info. I can probably try and send it in my in the chat. Um, my Instagram is amberbutler underscore. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Amber. That was really great. And I can see in the chat that everyone's really enjoyed themselves. Um, but now it's time for me to invite our next amazing artist on to get the next fun activity started. Michelle Reader is a sculptor based in Nottinghamshire. She makes characterful and objects, often of people or animals. And today, Michelle is inviting you all to use fine materials to create a wild miniature world of meadows, forests and wildlife inspired by Gainsborough's woodland landscape once again we will drop the link in the chat so you can all see what materials you need and what to expect please do have an adult supervising as well just in case um you need to cut anything out and stuff so we don't want anyone to get hurt today thank you again for joining us michelle if it's all right i'll hand it over to you to get started absolutely hello thank you um, great yeah so i'm a sculptor based in nottinghamshire um working with recycled materials i'm just going to share some slides to begin with to explain what we're going to do and then we can get cracking. Okay, so I hope you can see that okay. You might have to move a few spaces out of the way to see it, <laughs> possibly. Um, so these are some of my pieces. Um, one on the left is a heron, he's about six foot tall, so a bit larger than life. 
Uh, the B in the middle is also quite a bit larger than life. That's, um, I imagine it's about that big. <laughs> um, and all made from waste plastics, um, things like uh, an old builder's bucket, parcel strapping, milk bottles, um, the antenna, bits of an umbrella, a broken umbrella. So all kinds of things that have had a previous life. Um, and the image on the right there is a campaign that I did with a company called Hubbub in the Forest of Dean. So we collected litter from the forest and created an installation of flowers made of litter. So they're made of all kinds of things like cans and bottles, and lids and all kinds of things like that. Move on. So the piece in the collection that I've chosen today to, to look at was is by Thomas Gainsborough. It's a wooded landscape with uh, herdsmen and sheep and cattle. And the reason that I was interested in Gainsborough is because what he did later in his career was he used objects like broccoli um, and coal and rocks to create a model landscape, which he then painted from. So these kinds of objects, the kinds of things that he used to create his landscape uh, kind of as a model box, which he then yeah, drew from. So I thought it'd be quite fun to create a miniature world in a similar way using recycled materials. So um, obviously there's, there's a lot of problems at the moment with climate change and um, extinction of species. So increasing biodiversity in nature is really, really important. So, there's um, lots of rewilding going on around the country and lots of people are looking at ways to improve habitats for wildlife in their own streets and gardens and cities and, and rural areas as well. So um, just thinking about that in, in creating our miniature worlds is what a kind of wild world would look like. So um, it's a kind of hedgehog there. I actually saw a hedgehog in, in the alleyway on my street. But, so yeah, it's nightmare, the night before last, and I nearly trod on it. So I think I definitely need to make some holes in the fences for him to get through without being trodden on. Um, there's a beaver down there in North Nottinghamshire. They're um, creating, introducing beavers into the Idle Valley Nature Reserve, which is not far from my studio here. <clears throat> and then bees, obviously more wildflowers in our streets are needed and everywhere really. So creating routes for nature, to, for species to get around and be more resilient. And here's a few images of creatures that you might want to think about when you're creating your miniature landscapes, what kind of um, habitats they might need, whether it's a forest or a pond or a wetland area. And um, yeah, all different kinds of species that need somewhere to live and somewhere to find food and to flourish. So what we're going to do today is create miniature worlds, miniature wildernesses, perhaps. Um, and here's a few examples of ones that have been created in workshops in the past. Um, so the one on the left uses Play-Doh and an egg box and some wooden cutlery and twigs. And there's a little uh, plastic meerkat as well, which has been introduced into that one. Um, and then you've got one there where the creatures have been drawn and cut out. So it's another way of adding creatures into the environment. There's a little play animal in, that, in one of those as well. So lots of different materials have been used there to create these miniature worlds. Right, I'll stop sharing my screen now. I can find my cursor, there it is. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so what you'll need to start with, hopefully you've had the list in advance and we'll have found a few things, but do feel free to scurry off and look for things as we go. Um, so we need something to use as a base, so either a piece of a cardboard box or a cereal box or a board, wooden board or something, any kind of flat thing that you don't mind sacrificing to stick things to, to create your world. Um, and I've got one that I, Blue Peter style, I've got one I started earlier. So I'll grab that one. And here, that's the creature, so what you might want to do as well is see if you've got any existing creatures around your house. I've got this little model goat from a project that I did a while ago. Um, and you might want to use a little badger there as well. It's one of those schleich animals. Um, there's an elephant corkscrew. 
a nice one to make habitat for. Um, with a hippo. Um, or a, if you've got a little soft toy, that's a little soft toy frog. Um, and a little slight jaguar there as well. But um, the one I started thinking about when I started to create my landscape was this little goat here. So I start to make a hill or a mountain for them to climb up. So he's going to go on there. Uh, you can see that. So I basically started to create this landscape with a bit of an egg box, a bit of a cardboard box, and a couple of coffee cups, which I've joined together. Oops, now I'm looking everything over. Which I've joined together with various ways. I've made holes and put bits of string through and tied them together. Um, I stapled the box down. I used some paper fasteners to attach the coffee cups. Because I tend to try to avoid using glue and um, tape if I can, but also you might not have these things. So if you do want to use tape or glue or any other way of sticking things down, that's fine. So um, different types of tape you might have around the house. Paper tape is always better than plastic tape. If you can, there's masking tape or this kind of eco paper tape. Um, or cell tape if you can. resort to plastic, then that's fine too. Um, so you might want to, you could perhaps have taped this box down rather than stapled it if you don't have a staple gun. Um, or again with this, or you might want to use glue if you've got a print stick or some PVA glue. You could use glue to join things as well. And string is really useful. That's what I've used for this coffee cup here. I've just put holes through and then tied it inside the box. You can see that. Just tied it on. It's pretty secure. Okay, so that's another version of the hairs. So other materials you might want to use in creating your miniature worlds. Tubes, carpet tubes are always useful for creating trees. These kinds of things, especially these thinner ones that are from like foil and things like that. But the kitchen roll ones are quite good too, or toilet rolls and you can combine them. Um, good ways of sticking down tubes for a base. Rather than trying to glue a very thin edge like that, is to snip up into the tube and create a more of a flat surface that you can fix down. So cutting, cutting slits into it and then folding them out to create a flat surface. So then glue them down. Again, you could you could use tape or you could staple it down. Whatever method you've got available to you. I'll stick that up with an extra tree over here. It really doesn't want to stay on the mountain. So yeah, so that started off there. There's a bit of tape as well on the blue set. Tree there. So other things you might want to use, uh, maybe found things around your house. So you could raid your recycling bin, little bottles, foam, packaging, um, get these nice little trays that you get avocados in and stuff like that. Um, big boxes are always good to use. I quite like using these as it's the eyes and beak of a bird, but <laughs> you can also use it as rocks. So there's lots of shapes in there. Um, you might want to use some actual natural materials. So if you've got, I, think I needed to trim the lavender in my garden, so I've got some lavender. Um, there are some fallen leaves in the trees outside. Things like that, so I can, you could add those in and actually use some foliage within it. Other bits you might want to use, maybe bits of plastic bags and crystal kits, so a bit of bubble wrap, it's always fun. Um, yeah, crystal kits. Plastic bags, quite like this Asda bag because it's got a picture of bee on it, so I could actually cut that out and use it within the environment somewhere. So I'm always looking for colours and shapes and patterns within the things that I find. Um, sweet wrappers, I'm used to having chocolates lately, use some sweet wrappers. Um, also, if you've got any modelling material, clay or anything, that can be quite handy. So, Blue tap or something like that. So I could 
use a bit of clay just to build up different areas of it and to plant things in. Got to join things together, especially if you kind of pack crevices with it. In fact, I might do a bit of clay in there. Split that round. So this is an air drying clay that I'm using. But yeah, that's just an optional extra if you happen to have any. Um, other things that are useful for joining things together. Um, Pegs. So I've got a kind of branch that I've started, a tree even that I've started here, but made a hole in the top of the um, coffee cup with, you just make a hole with a pencil or something. Open the hole, show you. Just to poke the tree in. I want to make it wider. Uh, with something. So just use whatever you've got to hand just to widen out the holes and things like that. Um, so yes, yeah, so this tree goes in here like this. So I've tied on the wooden fork there with some string and pegged on another. So you yeah, so use the post peg here just to peg on another tree there, and that becomes another bit of the tree as well. So it's just a simple, easy way of joining things that's temporary as well. So if you wanted to reconstruct it later, you can. Um, paper clips as well, I did in a similar way for temporarily holding together bits of cardboard if you might want to change it or recycle it in something else later on. Um, let's show you. So over here I've got newspapers and magazines. So newspapers are great just for generally screwing up paint shapes with. So if you wanted to build up your mountain a bit more you could tape in some newspaper there. Um, also, magazines, especially I've got some of these wildlife magazines, you might find within the magazines images you want to use. So, here we've got some leaves, so I'm not going to cut that out, stick that on here. There might be a creature like this bird that I want to include. So, you can have a look through and see, or there might be people if you want to have some people in your environment. You could use images, maybe you want to glue them onto card and cut them out so they're a bit stiffer. You could also draw. Pictures. I've got one here that I've done earlier, which I've used like some green card and drawn a little green with picking. And then touch. In fact, I might use a little bit of blue tack for that one. Just glue it on, but that's got a weak figure. So then blue tack on and then. So that's another way of adding features in. If you haven't got any model features, you just want extra birds or butterflies or anything like that, you could draw them or find pictures of them, cut them out and stick them on a card and add them into your model. So I've also got here a pot of bits and bobs I've collected. So there's yeah, straws, cutlery, forks, various bits of plastic bottles and lids, um, car park tickets. So yeah, my studio have lots and lots of boxes of different things like this, so there's always lots of resources on hand. Um, so it's, it'd be great, it's great to have a box of bits at home if you're going to continue to do this kind of thing. Um, so you've always got something to dip into. Treat your waste as a resource, don't throw it all away. Um, so yeah, things like these yogurt pots, gooseberry yogurt, um, quite good shapes as well. You can cut them off. And then just cardboard. So thin card is always really useful. So cereal boxes are great for that. It's really easy to cut, and really easy to shape to turn into whatever structure you want. Um, and, uh, sandwich boxes as well. Quite good. Um, Board. So yeah, so I've got yeah, magazines, newspapers, cardboard, plastics, foliage, objects. Oh, and the wrapping paper. These kinds of these are from the who gives a crap toilet paper. I don't think anyone uses that. They're great, but great to hang on to use to use for collage and things. And I've got this wrapping paper that's got 
browse on it already, so I can see the bar. Um, old calendar that's got nice, nice pictures in it. Views, some trees and things. Those could be added in as well. Um, that's kind of a fashion catalogue sort of thing. It's got various things like people, many people in that one. So when people could use those kinds of magazines for that. So yes, that gives you a bit of an idea of a range of stuff you might want to gather together whilst building your creations. You might just go on forays around the house to find them as you go. So I'm just going to carry on working on mine while you carry on working on yours, hopefully. But do type into the chat if you've got any questions or suggestions and let me know what you're making, uh, what creature you're using. Yeah, so just any questions as we go. And as I go along, if anyone wants me to demonstrate someone, just say so and I can. Um, and I'll just kind of make them suggest some things as we go along together. So I think I'm going to add a bit of my water here down here with my bubble wrap. So I might just make a little hole inside this cup just to. So I thought I can use this tool, which is called an awl, which I doubt many of you will have, but one or two you might. It's quite useful. Um, to make a hole inside that cup there. I'll just take the goat off so I don't keep my thumb down. Now we use a pair of flies to widen out the hole a little bit so I can poke me. Much further. A dinosaur. Amazing. Let's get the dinosaur will look like a lot wilder than our one. Okay. Yeah, that's Staple here as well. I'm just going to staple together some of these bits of. I have a river flowing off the edge of my board there. Small sweet wrappers to make some little fish to come down the waterfall. Just a little bit of salmon. Just going to freehand cut those out. Oh, yeah, 100 sea world would be great.
It's really, really hard to remember. Yeah, the rain on the roof. <laughs> I'll just put some more K on. So, right things in. I might put some clay for the goat to stand in as long as he doesn't keep falling off the mountain. Some great pictures in this magazine. Oh, okay, so Lauren Marie has asked if I tend to use templates or patterns for sculptures of animals and wildlife, or do I refer to images? And see what shapes and materials work best from there. The second, I think, yeah. So, um, that, what I can do actually is while you're working with sculptures, I can show you a little video of one of my sculptures being made. Which I'm going to touch my laptop. I'm just going to share my screen again and show you a short film. So this is a sculpture, it's actually of a goat, which is quite apt. <laughs> so that's why I've got this little model goat, because I have the little model of a goat to refer to. And then I did some life-size drawings at the start as well. And then started looking for materials. Yes, okay, so this was a goat on a mountain of electrical waste. There were bits of washing machine that I found, fly tips, and nature reserves. And this is an old bike. So looking for shapes that fit in different places. So those um, mud guards are quite nice curves for their chest and their stomach. And a bit of a large um, track pen for the neck shape. So once I know what animal I'm creating, I'm sort of on the lookout for things that are good shapes. Perhaps for those chair legs, nice shapes of the legs. Bits of the inside of the fridge in the back there. I'm involved in that one. Just clicking in place one and look at which bits go away. And the way I've used the um, clothes pegs is just temporarily holding things with clamps and things just to see what's going to work. I've used pop rivets then to attach those. Shape to fit on the back of the leg.
this kind of plastic mesh stuff, which is really great. And I'm using um, bits of um, inner tube from bike tunnels to make them kind of furry. Um, kind of chest. It's a particular, I think you can see the image up on the wall at the back there. These are the reference images that I used. Um, yeah, so Faggot goat is a particular type of wild goat that has a combination of black and white. Um, I'm always kind of referring back to the images, to this, the scale and the shapes. So we can. It's a winter when I was making that, it's really hot. There's a lot of inner tubes in that one. <laughs> I hope that helps answer your question as to how, how it comes together. So yeah, so a bit of referring back to drawing. So the whole the force on the wall behind me is sculpture I'm working on in, in a similar way. So I use that as reference um, and build the sculpture in front of it so I can see the shapes in the drawing behind as I try and build up the form. Now, as long getting on the bones, you actually managing to create something. I guess if you don't manage to create something during this quite short period of time, you can always come back to it later on. Yeah, it'd be great to see what you've created. Ah, someone's asked how long it takes me to make a sculpture like that. Um, it really depends. Sometimes, often it depends how long I've got, because there is a commission they open front of quite quickly. But for that particular sculpture, I actually had whole lockdown to make it because it's, in fact, I could still be making it now, but because the exhibition it was for still hasn't happened yet. It was supposed to happen in July 2020. And at the same time as I was making that sculpture, I was also making um, another one, the Bearded Vulture, which was inspired by um, a vulture that came over from the Alps and was in, was um, roosting in the Peak District for a while, not far from here. Um, so those two sculptures I was working on for about six months in total, both the two alongside each other. Um, so yeah, so I guess two or three months for that one. I don't know we have the luxury of that uninterrupted time. <laughs> one positive about lockdown. Most of them are the other men. Some of this flowering up in here, I get the meadow. Section 
I guess it's cut a hole into it as well, so the cavities and have great habitat. Like an owl or something to use them. Using scissors to make the hole a bit wider. Just a little sweet wrappers and a little nest to go in the branch of the tree. A little bit of blue touch hold that in. And the, and the ginkgo. Wow, you're making two miniature rolls. Okay. Oh, no, that sounds good. Okay. I'm sure I've seen pictures of these later on. Use that little bit to keep it so this lavender ring along the edge of the middle. My little badger here, so I might make a little badger set for him around the back for some more. I think I might cut my coffee cup in half so it's kind of a entrance to the badger set. So, 
So we're going to do that. So the hydrogen from the next turn. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, that's right, is that right, Emma? Yeah, that's right. That's great. Thank you. I have to put a few finishing touches to mine. It's really more fork thing for the trees, I think. Make it as green as possible in the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dead wood around the bottom of the trunk, so the beetles to live in. It's lightly covered, bit of log there, I can imagine. <laughs> you want to live here? <laughs> it's just going for me to shrink down small enough. Yeah, as I'm sure you can imagine, you could go on for ages with this. We could make a little log cabin up here, maybe. Um, there's a place more birds. That's frozen bees for the meadow. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. As with most art, you can carry on. You can carry on and usually you end up ruining it, ruining it if you go into them. <laughs> Stop that. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed making yours too. I look forward to seeing the results. So don't forget to share. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle. I just had to do a dramatic room change as um, I heard that I sounded like a robot and it was a bit of a blur before. So sorry about that. Hopefully, everyone can hear and see me again. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed that. I've seen all the messages and everyone looks like they're having a great time. So do send us everything you've made to at Court of the Rise on social media and to Michelle as well. Michelle, do you want to let everyone know how to get these to you? Yes, actually. Uh, it's like I went the right way around for you, I hope it is. <laughs> it's back to front of yes, perfect. <laughs> so that's my, I'm on, on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. There's at Michelle 3D UK, and then that's my website there as well. 
Perfect. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. <laughs> we'll talk okay. about that as well. <laughs> and we all love your imaginary world. I am a bit sad that no one's making an under the sea one though, because that would be what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's now time for our last workshop of the day. Last but not least, I am thrilled to introduce you all to Helen Can. Helen is an illustrator specializing in hand-drawn maps and is the author of Hand-Drawn Maps, A Guide for Creatives. Her maps have appeared in film, TV shows, and books. They've helped wanderers, armchair explorers, festival goers, and nature lovers folded small into brochures or shouting loudly on signage. Today, Helen is asking you to take part in her workshop, Mapping an Ideal World. She wants you all to imagine your own ideal world and use whatever mark-making skills you want to draw a map of your own world filled with land, water, and plant features. And before I hand it over to Helen, I just wanted to remind everyone to have an adult supervising at all times and to use the chat to speak to us. We will get the link in the chat again so you can see what materials Helen has asked you to have for this workshop. Okay, Helen, I will leave it to you and Acacia will share your slides just now as well. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Leila. Hello, everyone. I am um, an artist and illustrator from Brighton, as Leila said. Um, this is an example of one of my illustrations. Um, this is a map of my ideal world, and that is exactly what we are going to be doing today. You are going to be drawing your ideal world. Um, Acacia, can we go to the next slide? Lovely. So this is a painting <clears throat> which is in the Courtauld collection, and it's a landscape with the flight into Egypt by an artist called Peter Bruegel Elder. And he was born a very, very long time ago in the 16th century in the Netherlands. It's not a real landscape, it's um, a made up one. It doesn't look like the Netherlands at all. It is, the artist has just picked out the bits that he most liked, that he thought was the most beautiful. So for him, he wanted a landscape with lots of mountains and trees, a river, a lake. Um, and in particular, he liked the kind of landscapes that you see in Greece or Italy, so classical landscapes. He didn't paint the world as he saw it, he made changes to it. So for him, this is his ideal world. So before we start mapping our ideal worlds, I would like you to have a think about what you would have in your world. Before I start any mapping, I always make a, a list of the things that are gonna go in the map. So for me, I would add trees, animals, flowers and insects, but maybe yours has got no pollution, 24 hour access to Fortnite maybe, pizza trees. What kind of thing would you um, have in your world? So two minutes. Either write a list of your ideas or talk to whoever you're with and uh, have a quick chat about what you want in your world. I think I want monkeys. That's what I want in my world. Monkeys and giant cats. And um, I quite like coffee. So something more coffee maybe and uh, clean rivers, very important, and lots of rainforest. I like that, all transport to be like roller coasters, brilliant. That would be very cool if, there might be a lot of sick people um, every time you travel though, or scared people. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of roller coasters. I think I'd like uh, air balloons, hot air balloons everywhere. Nice, mountains, streams, trees, birds, rainforests, great ideas. I'm not a big fan of cars, so I'm not sure I'd have any cars in my, my world. Okay, so 
Pandas football, netball and sweets, also a very good idea. Um, we're going to put that list to a side now. Caves, caves is a big theme this morning. Um, we're gonna, we've thought about what we're going to put in our map. So we're going to put it aside and we're going to look and think about making our map now. So firstly, if we could go to slide four, Acacia. We're going to talk about my maps. This is the kind of thing I do. As Leila said, I specialise in drawing maps, all sorts of things like books, signs you see on walks, and there's props in film and TV. Um, recently, I had some map props in the background of His Dark Materials, which you might have seen on the BBC earlier on in the year. This one is an illustration from a book, and it uh, shows all the things that I would really like on an island. Um, it's got trees and rivers and animals. I quite like whales. I like lots of fish. It's got some seagulls down at the bottom. Like Peter Bruegel, I've added all the things that I think make for a beautiful world. When I do a map, I usually um, give the map a decorated border, which you can see all the way around the outside. That's called a neat line, and that just keeps the, the map in place. At the bottom, the bottom left, you can see a compass rose, and that gives us the directions uh, on the map. Usually, um, certainly on Western maps, uh, we have north at the top. So you have north, east, south, west going around. And often those uh, compass roses are really beautifully decorated, although you can just draw, draw an arrow with a, with a nan at the top. And as soon as you do that, everybody knows it's a map. It's a, it's a good symbol for a map. And the other thing that's really important in a map is a title. So at the top right, we've got a map of Hope Rock. Your uh, world will be called something different. Um, I quite like doing decorative titles. So this one has got lots of seaweed on it, but maybe yours would have pandas or sweets or teddy bears or whatever you want in your world. Okay, next um, slide please, Acacia. So this was a drawing of the map that you saw right at the very beginning. And as you can see, I'm using lots of different mark making, marks uh, that I've made with my pen um, to create the sea. Uh, to create rivers and forests and then I've also put all the features that I want in my ideal world and there's some more whales, there's flying jaguars, quite like dodos, um, singing crocodiles and snowy mountains, oh and there's a goat king so there's all, often a, there's always a, um, there's always a goat in these workshops I find. So now we are going to draw our own maps, um, not of the world that we see it now, but of an ideal world, like Peter Bruegel and like these maps. So slide six, please, Keisha. Let's start. You'll need your A4 piece of paper and a pencil or pen. And uh, you will need to draw the outline of your map. And the neat line, which is that decorative border that I mentioned. So I've got an A4 piece of paper and a Posca pen, which is just a thick black pen, but you don't need that. You can use whatever you like. And the most simple neat line you can do is something that looks like that. Just a line all the way around your piece of paper. If you want, you can make it more decorative. So I'm going to make mine a little bit wider and give it some dots. Maybe some dots in the corner. You can see dots in the corner. It's a little bit prettier than just the line. Then I want you to think about drawing your compass rose. 
doesn't have to be complicated. It can just be an arrow with the north, or you can do um, one which is a little bit more elaborate, like the one on the screen. All it means is doing a freehand circle, like that. My circles are probably a lot worse than Amber's. Cross it in the middle, like that. And then make a star shape again, like that. And then I always remember it never eat shredded wheat, north, east, south, west. <laughs> it's true, Amber, they are hard to draw. Um, and then you can decorate your compass rows as much as you like. So maybe I'm going to put circles in mine, some of mine. And stripes and some pattern it can be as rough or as careful as you like. Something that makes it look decorative. I think I might draw some. Um, zigzags around the outside as well. Remember this map is your ideal world, so you can do whatever you like. You don't have to copy me, you can if you want, but um, completely up to you. And if you'd like to use color, do that too. This is what my compass rose looks like at the moment. Coming along. And I'm making my Neat line, a little bit dotty all the way up. Now it's like that. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Actually, could you remove that one for me and just come back to the main screen for me? Thank you. Uh, thank you. What um, I'd like you to do now is draw the outlines of your ideal world. So if you remember the original map that I, I put up, it was an island. So I'm gonna make mine an island. You don't need to make uh, yours an island if you don't want to, but you need to, Give the landscape an edge, like that. So this is going to be my land and this is going to be my sea. And then we have to decide what we're going to call our world. Um, my world, I think, is going to be called um, the 
happy island, the happy island. So I'm going to give it a title. It was called a cartouche, if you remember. I'm going to make a little box in the corner and I'm going to call it the happy island. You need to label your world. Just use simple capital letters. And if you want to make it properly fancy, I quite like strengthening one side of the letter. So if you look at, this as an example, you've just written capital letters, but I've taken each side, one side of the letters and given it a little bit more weight, a little bit more oomph. So I've made it thicker and darker and that makes it look a little nicer. So, The title is always really important on a map because you need to know where it is. And I might add a little bit of decoration. So that's what my cartouche looks like. It's a little bit rough and ready, but it'll look lovely when it's finished. Thanks for the top tip about circle making, Dern Cat. I make, she makes a quarter turn of the page until finished and it works for either right or left hand. It's a good tip. Okay, so a map always needs some features. So if you remember from Peter Bruegel, there were rivers, there were mountains and there were trees. Map makers historically use lots of different types of marks using their pens to distinguish water from grassland, grassland from mountains, for example. Mark making means using different types of stroke with your pen or your pencil. So we might think for um, a mountain, we could do zigzags. That's a type of mark making for a mountain. For water, it would be a little bit more wavy. Maybe we can do some parallel, parallel lines like that. Or for the sea, maybe we could do some waves. Like that. So what we are going to do now is um, think about how we can use different marks to distinguish, for example, sea and river, because those two bodies of water look very different, don't they? How do we make the sea look different to the river? Um, next slide, please, Acacia. Lovely. So as you can see on this slide, we've got sea and waves. I've called my sea the sea of dolphins because I like dolphins. And um, we've got rivers and streams. They look very different from the, from the choppy waves of the sea. Deltas, that means where the river gets to the edge of the land. And marshland, because it's kind of a bit of a mix between the land and the sea. So what, what does that look like? Has that got grass growing there? We've got lakes. And then we need to think about how we cross the water. So um, maybe you need a boat, maybe you need some stepping stones. I've got a bridge of biscuits. Um, I don't know how that will function very well with the water, but um, it's worth, worth a try, I think. So for the next five minutes, I'd like you to add some water features to your map, to your island. So for me, I'm gonna add some rivers and I'm gonna use different types of marks to um, include in C. And I'm going to label my C. It's going to be called the C of uh, 
uh, Wales, because I like Wales. And I'm going to put some rivers in, coming from the centre of the island, lots of long, windy lines. In the delta where it reaches the edge of the land. Marshland, some grass. You look a bit like upturned eyelashes. And don't forget to label your map. So um, what is the name of the river? What's the name of the sea? If you've got a lake on there, what are you going to call your lake? And is anything going to be in the lake? Maybe the panda's going for a swim. My river is going to be called the River of Joy. And my marshes. <laughs> yeah, why not? So of course you could draw a map of your life. Um, maybe you could have the river of childhood or the lake of old age. One more minute, drawing your water, and then we'll go um, go uh, on to um, some mountains because all islands need mountains. Oh, and I think I might add a little bridge going over the river as well. Brilliant. So this is what my map looks like so far. I've got seas, I've got a river, I've got marshes and a lake and a little bridge with a turret. So next slide, please, Acacia. Mountains and hills. How can we make mountains, hills and plains look different from each other? You can see mountains can be drawn with zigzags, easy up and down, up and down with high points or lower points. And sometimes it's quite good to have lower mountains in front of the larger mountains. Hills and hillocks are a bit less brutal, a bit less hard. And they've got nice, soft, round, curvy lines. And then the plains, 
or even flatter still. So flat lines. What I quite like doing also is to add shading. And you can use hatching, which is like these parallel lines or solid color. And if you look, for example, on The Hobbit, um, if you've ever read that, in the end papers, you've got maps of Middle Earth and Tolkien, who created those maps, used a similar idea in making the, giving the, the mountains and the hills a little bit of volume by adding that solid color. So you now have five minutes to add some mountains and hills to your uh, island. My mountains are going to be really tall. And I'm going to have some smaller mountains in front. And I'm going to put some snow caps on them. I'm going to be quite rugged. And then I'm going to have some hills. Softer lines. With some shading always on one side. As if the light is coming from the same direction. That's what mine looks like at the moment. I'll put some planes in, soft areas, but much flatter lines, and I might add a few grass, a few grasses. And then, of course, don't forget to label your mountains, your hills and your plains. What are you going to call them? My mountains are going to be called the Merry Mountains. And the Hills of Hope. And the Plentiful Plains. One more minute to do our mountains. Put 
Brilliant. So this is what my map looks like at the moment. You've got mountains, you've got plains, and you've got hills. Next slide, please, Acacia. Finally, we need to add some trees and forests. So we're going to use continuous marks. So that means that your pen doesn't leave the, leave the paper. What I'd like you to do is find a space on your, on your map, for example, here, and draw a, a forest boundary like that. Maybe you can do one, maybe you want more than one forest. I'm gonna to have to, I think. And name your forest. So you need to put the name inside. So mine will be, um, let's see. Uh, butterfly, butterfly forest. Like so. And then using that continuous mark, for example, an M that you just keep moving your, your hands in the same direction, fill the space with rounded shapes, rounded marks. They look like, makes them look like trees. Again, if you look in a book like The Hobbit, the end papers, this is exactly how the forests are created in that map. And if you haven't come up with a name for your forest, you can always label it at the bottom. So it looks like that. If you want to make the trees look like pine trees, you can use zigzag continuous marks. So they're much more pointed. Obviously, if you want to do individual trees and some spaces, there's some ideas on the slide there. Trees are very important, as you know. That's my zigzaggy pine tree forest. And I'm going to add some single trees elsewhere. Little lollipop trees. And then I might add a little bit more vegetation, for example, some grasses, some patterns, some shrubs. Lots of different types of marks to fill the space. I quite like a busy map with lots, lots happening. Lots of pattern. Can you take the slide down for me, Acacia? So back to the main screen, that's it. So this is what my map looks like at the moment. Hopefully yours looks similar, but with your choice of what goes on the map. Now I'd like you to go back to your original list of what you would have in your ideal world. So for me, I, my list was, where have I put it? Monkeys, giant cats, coffee, clean rivers, rainforests, and hot air balloons. That was on my list, what was on yours? You've now got five minutes to add all of those things to your map, what would make your ideal world. So maybe add pizza trees. The field full of cats, brilliant, I would have that too. So add the cats to your map. I think I had a giant cat, so 
my cat is shut in the other room meowing and he wants to come and join the workshop. So apologies if you can hear him, but I'll draw him in my map. He's here in spirit. He's a black cat, so I'm going to draw a black cat. And he's called Marvin. And I want rainforests. Maybe I'll do, yeah, hot air balloons. Hot air balloons would be nice. Comic islands. <laughs> Great. I think I'm going to have two hot air balloons because they're nice to draw. Rainforests, I was going to have so those can go in the mountains. I like the idea of pandas. There were a lot of panda suggestions going on. I think maybe I'll have some pandas somewhere. And if you want to label things, don't forget to label things. <laughs> it's true, I am going to enjoy having insects on my island. Maybe I'll put some butterflies in, that'd be quite nice. Some caterpillars would be lovely. So hopefully your map will be full of things that you would really like in your island. Mine has got panda and it's got two um, air balloons and a giant cat and a rainforest. And um, what else? A caterpillar climbing up the, a mountain. Um, all using lots of different types of marks. So curve marks for the sea, zigzag marks for the pine forest, roundy marks for um, deciduous forest, upside down eyelashes for marshes, and I've labeled it all. So this, I know this, um, the big draw theme this year was about making the change. And a very wise friend of mine said to me, you have to imagine a different world to create a different world. So hopefully 
by you drawing an imaginary ideal world, maybe some point in the future that world will, um, will happen, fingers crossed. Okay, final slide, Acacia. That's the one, that's um, my details. You can see the original ideal world map that I did up there and my website, helencan.co.uk and my email contact at helencan.co.uk. I'm also on Instagram um, at Helencan Maps. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that. And if you haven't finished, you can uh, can carry on and use a bit of colour. And it would be lovely if you could post. Um, post. Thanks, Laura Marie. Um, is that all right, Leila? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Helen. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking that maybe my housemate's suggestion of um, roller coasters instead of public transport would probably not be a good idea. <laughs> I was just thinking we often get though because we're both from Scotland we get the train back up to Scotland I'm like I think a six hour roller coaster would probably not be a good idea. No there'd be a lot of sick people a lot of sick people. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much again and um, you're I'm welcome. Send um, at Port Res and also Helen these maps that you've made today. Um, I'd love to see them. Yeah me too it's been such a fun morning getting creative and I hope that everyone has been having a wonderful time so far I know I have it is now time for us to move on to our open house our object study session with our prints and drawings team the object study part of this event is designed for older art enthusiasts giving you all an opportunity to ask questions um, with our experts here who know our works on paper in our collection better than anyone else and this remaining time will allow rare up close and personal object study sessions. In these sessions, we have um, Ketty Cotardo and Rachel Sloan. So Ketty is our curator of drawings and Rachel is our assistant curator of works on paper. So I will ask you to put your questions throughout into the chat and I will ask them at the end. So thank you, Ketty and Rachel. I'm not sure who wants to go first just now. Um, I'm happy to go first. Amazing. Well, I'll hand it over to you, Rachel, and then straight on to Katie. Thank you, Brilliant. Um, Well, first of all, uh, hello and a very warm welcome to our, our virtual uh, print study room. Um, so as Layla has said, uh, Katie and I look after the Courtauld's collection of prints and drawings, which is, um, which is really large. Uh, we've got about 7,000 drawings and about 26,000 prints. And for um for um today's big draw event we have decided to focus on um drawings that show artists um reusing and recycling um whether that's reuse of paper or reuse of of imagery or just yeah just um and um it was some it was something of a challenge for us to come up with a selection and that isn't because there were so few examples in the collection, it's because there were so many, it was really tough to make a choice. So what we've done is we've, um, we've, um, we've um, chosen six drawings that um, cover the whole time span of the collection um, to show you, um, to, to, give, to give you a sense of how, how artists have, have recycled and reused um, throughout history. And before I get started um, showing you my first drawing, I just want to say a little bit about the history of paper and paper making. Today, we take the availability of paper uh, very much for granted. Um, if we run out of paper, we, can, we, we, we know we can just, you know, dash off to the shops to get, you know, a ream of 500 sheets very easily. This is actually, in the history of paper making, this is a really recent phenomenon. It's only since 1799 that paper has been made by machine uh, on an industrial scale. Up until then, paper was handmade each one sheet at a time. And consequently, it was a lot more expensive than it is today. And anyone who worked with paper, an artist, a writer, um, any really anyone who used paper, did not take its existence for granted. They, they, they tried generally to get as much use out of a single sheet as they possibly could. And 
we see all through the history of art, artists being very careful and very creative with with how with 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 their with their paper supplies. Um, so I'm just going to start with my my first example. Right. Okay. Um, so as I said, I, um, we've tried to um, uh, make selections of, of drawings from across the whole uh, time span of the collection. So this is the the earliest one um, that I've chosen. This is one of the um, one of the older works in the collection. This is a drawing by an artist from Florence named Pontormo. Um, and Pontormo was a um, uh, considered a, a mannerist artist. That is, he, um, he focused on the human figure. He portrayed the human figure in poses that look incredibly elegant and graceful. But when you actually try them out yourself, you, you find that they're either impossible or extremely uncomfortable. Um, so, Naturally, he produced a lot of figure studies in preparation for his paintings. And this particular drawing um, of a, um, a, a, a youth um, seated in, in this um, rather complicated pose um, is a sheet that isn't actually, it's not actually um, connected to any of his finished paintings, but it's something that he would have done in his workshop to practice, I mean, to, to just, to, just to, 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 keep, to keep up his practice of drawing the figure with very, very strong, decisive gestures. And the, um, the model for this drawing, we think is probably one of his, one of his workshop assistants. He, um, he worked in a, um, a large workshop to um, a number of artists and apprentices who helped, helped him keep up with all his commissions. And these um, young apprentices who are called Garzoni would sometimes be roped in to um, to pose um, for works as, as well as assisting with the with the, um, with the um, other tasks. So Pontormo has had had one of his, one of his apprentices sit down and assume this um, very um, uh, twisted pose, and has 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 drawn it um, um, has, has, has 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 drawn him incredibly quickly and fluently. Um, but. He has, I, want, I don't want to say he's made a mistake, but he, he clearly changed his mind about a couple of aspects of the composition. He changed his mind about the outline of, um, of the boy's garment, um, as you see, but um, just, just um, below his waist. He also changed his mind about the position of his hand, which is resting on a ledge. And so first example of an artist being careful of his paper supply, he didn't just chuck the sheet of paper when he decided he wanted to change the position of the hand and the outline of the garment. He just he just drew in the new um, the new contour right there. And this is um, and um, keep, um, keeping um, keeping the, um, the the evidence of the the original line rather than trying to erase it. That's that's something called a um, pentimento, um, which literally means re repentance, a change of mind. Um, so he's got this amazing, really fluid drawing of a figure, um, which he uses as, as practice and, and possibly as inspiration for other, um, other works. But because paper is precious, he turns it over and he draws, on, he, and, and he uses the, 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 the other side of the sheet for another drawing. Or actually, possibly, he may have passed it on to someone else in his workshop to draw on. So the um, the, ver the back, or what we call the, the verso of the sheet, shows uh, a study of the figure of Saint Jerome. And this and and this drawing we actually know is connected to a specific painting. Um, but as scholars have looked at it over the years, they've realized that the um, the, the the style of the drawing isn't quite the same as. Um, works that are known to be by Pontormo. So it's now thought that um, it may be the work of one of his workshop assistants. So the same sheet of paper being um, being used by multiple people in the same workshop. That was something that was that was quite common back in um, back in the day. And you can tell that it's a drawing that had a lot of use in the workshop. It's 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 covered in stains. It's um, the edges are a little bit tattered. This is a drawing that that that, that was yeah that, that really saw a lot of use. But you might be wondering why it's got um, some some of these weird gray splotches on it. 
And that's because at some point, probably, uh, I mean, possibly during Pontormer's lifetime, but I think I, I suspect more likely after his death, someone who acquired the drawing decided that it was that it, rather than just being workshop material, they thought it was like it was this, this is, I mean, they, they realized this is a really beautiful drawing. This is really precious. We, you know, we treasure it. And, but it's just kind of a shame that it's got all these stains on it. So someone at some point um, tried to cover up some of those stains with, um, with white gouache, um, also known as body color. And this is kind of like um, early Tipex um, to, try to, to try to make the sheet pristine again. But the trouble with um, white gouache is that it contains lead and lead oxidizes over time. So these, these corrections, this, these attempts to cover up uh, past stains have actually turned into, into gray, gray blotches and stains on the sheet itself. Um, but definitely a, a, a good example of yes, just try, trying, trying, to, trying to save and trying to rescue um, paper that is, that is damaged. And one of the things that I think is particularly intriguing about this drawing is that not only is Pontormo and the members of his workshop recycling and reusing paper, uh, he's also recycling and reusing a pose that um, has a lot of recent history across Italian art. Um, and we think that he, um, he may have been inspired um, to ha um, have his, his apprentice, his Garzone, pose this way um, because he, he had looked at Raphael's uh, fresco, um, the School of Athens in, in the Vatican. And um, he, he was particularly inspired by the pose of the, uh, the figure of the philosopher um, Heraclitus. Um, it a, um, it's his, the, the, pose, the pose of the boy in his drawing is kind of a mirror image um, and a slight variation on um, Raphael's uh, philosopher. And of course, Raphael um, wasn't being entirely original himself in choosing this pose. He had been looking to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which was uh, pretty much next door to where the, um, the School of Athens was painted. And he's looking at the work of um, Michelangelo, who um, one of the most distinctive um, aspects of the Sistine Chapel ceiling was the, these, these amazing um, male nudes called ig ig ignudi um, in very, very complicated poses. And yet again, Michelangelo wasn't being entirely original in these poses. He, he was looking to something even older. He was looking to um, a fragment of a sculpture, which is either, either Greek or more likely a Roman copy of a Greek sculpture, which had been um, rediscovered in Rome in, um, in the early 15th century and which was available um, for artists to look at and study um, in, in Rome, in the, in the Vatican. So we have here a drawing that is not only um, an instance of reusing and recycling painting um, uh, uh, um, poses from other, other, other paintings and sculptures, but it's also, um, yes, so it's like, like every, every kind of recycling you can, you can think of is um, you, can, you can see on, on view in, in this drawing. Now, Katy is going to show you a few, um, a few more um, older drawings from the, um, Probably the, from, from the 17th century, but I actually want to leap forward to the 19th century. And we're now in a period when, um, when paper is now made on an industrial scale, it's made by machine, it's very widely available. And yet artists are still being thrifty with paper and they're, and they're, 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 they're still finding very creative ways to, to recycle and reuse. And one particularly interesting example of that is this drawing by Edouard Manet. Um, it comes from fairly early in his career. It's, um, it's, a, uh, um, it's one of his first attempts at representing a female nude, which was um, a, ch a challenge that he realized he would have to really grapple with. Um, it's one of the, one of the central um, subjects in the history of art. So, think, so he, he, this is the thing he, he thought if, like, he, if he was going to be taken seriously as an artist, he really had to engage with this subject. So he represented uh, a woman at her bath with a servant in the background. And um, she looks like she's been surprised by someone um, either uh, stumbling upon her and she's um, looking out at the, like straight at the viewer, which, um, so he's, he's, he's taken a very um, time-honored 
subject, a, a, a woman bathing, but he's put a very modern spin on it. And he made he um he actually made this drawing as um in preparation for a print for an etching, um, of which we're very fortunate to have um, have an impression in the in the Courtauld collection, and. You can see here, I'm showing you both sides of the, of the sheet, that he did actually use the drawing to transfer the design, um, certainly of the, um, the figure of the bathing woman onto the copper etching plate. Uh, and you can see um, he's, he's, he's used a, a needle or a blade to, um, to, tra to, 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 to trace over the, the, those lines and transfer them onto the, um, the, the etching plate, which would have been coated with a dark ground. Um, but if you look at the at the the, rec, the, the, um, the drawing itself, you also see that some parts of the drawing are very, um, very highly finished. Um, Mane is very definite about what he wants to, um, how he wants to pose the female bather. But we can also see that he hasn't quite made up his mind about how he wants to pose the figure of the, the maidservant in the background. And we can see him in the um, in the upper left corner um, experimenting with um, turning her head toward the viewer, having her turn turn away. Um, he hasn't he has he hasn't quite made up his mind. Um, and rather rather than you know just start afresh on a on a different sheet of paper, he's decided to just explore all those possibilities on a single sheet. And it looks as if um, it's only on the um, the etching plate that he find that he finally um, decides exactly how he wants to pose the maid servant. Now, um, again, we have that we have this um, this uh, idea of not on, not only you know being um, recycling, reusing, being thrifty with paper, but also with um, with motifs. Also with um with the pose, um, this is a period in Manet's art when he was I mean, he was as as I mentioned before he was he was very interested with um grappling with the the problem of the um the female nude and how like how how to represent her in a in a modern way, and although he didn't produce any other um any other uh, etchings or paintings directly from this drawing, um it's seems to stay, uh, remained in his possession and um for the rest for you know for the rest of his career he like he, he I, I, I suspect he probably used it as reference material for other um other paintings that he was working on uh around the same time um the pose is very very similar to uh, a painting called the startled nymph which he which, which he would have been doing it at exactly the same time the one um which is now um in in um, the museum of fine arts in buenos aires and uh, and um, more famously, um, his uh, very, very, very scandalous um, painting, uh, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, um, which he exhibited at the Salon des Refusés in 1863, um, which is another extremely uh, modern and confrontational nude where she's actually looking directly out at the viewer. So my, um, my last example, is um, a beautiful watercolor by uh, a British artist named Frederick Walker, um, who's active in the, the middle of the 19th century. He, um, in my humble opinion, he's not nearly as well known as he deserves to be. Um, I think he, he was, I mean, he was re really, really brilliant um, watercolorist, um, unfortunately died quite young. And I'm very happy to say that this particular watercolor is going to be on view um, in the Courtauld Gallery when we are reopen next month. So do come and have a look at, at it yourself when you can. Um, so this is a view, um, very idyllic, poetic view of a, um, a cottage garden in, in the country. And you might be wondering why I've chosen it. Um, it looks like a very, you know, like a very, very high, highly finished watercolor that we don't, we don't see any, you know, examples of uh, mistakes or rethinking of anything. Um, but there's something actually hiding below the lower edge of the um, of the image. This is normally how we how we mount it and how we display it, and it's this is usually how it's reproduced 
in exhibition catalogs. But if you take the mount off the watercolor, this is what's hiding beneath. So Walker actually left a strip of about a, a bit over an inch wide at the bottom of the of the paper. He left it bare, and he used it as a kind of improvised palette. So we see him experimenting with different, you know, um, uh, di different 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 shades of of watercolor, like uh, in introducing different amounts of white into his colors. Um, he was um, he was frequently criticized for his over over reliance on um, on white in his watercolors. So perhaps this is him trying to trying to minimize his use of it, like trying trying to like work out how he can how he how he can get away with using less. But I think this is a real. I mean, this 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 is really intriguing to me because Walker is working at a time when paper is very widely available. It's cheap. He could easily have done this. Um, color mixing, color experimenting, either on another piece of paper or on a on a you know a, a proper palette, and yet he didn't. And what's even more intriguing is that he didn't um, he didn't then cut the um, um, the the color test strip off the off the sheet when he when he finished the watercolor. He simply he he he, he chose to leave it on, and. I actually have got no idea why he did this, and I would be very, very intrigued um, if any anyone um, has any theories as to why he might have left it on. So those are those are my three selections, and um, I'd like to um, now hand over to Ketty, who will show you a few um, few others. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to start immediately by sharing my PowerPoint. Here we go. Just putting this down so I don't see. Uh, yes, welcome everyone. I'm really delighted to be presenting some of our uh, drawings, some of the drawings in our uh, collection, and um, trying to choose uh, um, drawings that uh, show change. As Rachel has said, uh, wasn't uh, easy simply because, yeah, there are so many, but I hope that the choices that we made today. Um, uh, interested you and that you found uh, or you will find yeah uh, something uh, that it's there for you that sort of has uh, ticked your um, interest and uh, curiosity. Uh, step backward, we're going back to the um, actually 17th century to the Baroque with an artist, Italian, an artist called Giovanni Francesco Barbieri, uh, whose nickname was Guercino, which means uh, squint-eyed. Mm, during his time, uh, paper was still, as Rachel said, uh, handmade, but um, it was clearly much more readily available. There were many more uh, paper makers, and um, Guercino drew uh, a lot. He, he, he also reused paper, or someone else reused paper, you'll see um, in a little while why I say this. But um, mm, there are so many existing surviving drawings and we have to take into account that some probably were destroyed and some got uh, lost that uh, uh, we must think that he drew yeah every day and um, produced several drawings uh, every day um, to tell you how yeah how many drawings he, he did uh, i should simply mention the fact that no art historian so far has had the courage to put them all together in a single uh, catalog which would be sort of normal practice for um, for every artist almost every artist has a catalog resonate uh, uh, Katie, really sorry to interrupt but we can't see your um, slides in full view at the moment oh so you might need to switch to use slideshow oh sorry i thought it was a slideshow sorry Okay, so uh, what was I going to say? Yes, so <laughs> excuse me, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> and he drew, uh, yeah, he drew a lot, as I was saying, and no art historian had uh, so far the courage to sort of compile uh, a catalogue of all his uh, uh, drawings, bringing them all uh, together. 
And um, for this specific uh, composition uh, of Sisyphus, uh, there are in fact eight existing drawings and I will show you a few of them uh, soon. But I should tell you, first of all, uh, who Sisyphus uh, was. So um, this is a mythological uh, figure and um, who was condemned uh, for the rest of his life to push a rock up, uh, up a hill and um, which would inevitably fall, fall back. And, um, and throughout, let's say the Renaissance and the Baroque, uh, there have been several representation uh, of, uh, of this figure. In, for Guercino, this was in preparation for a painting that he was commissioned. Um, and, um, and we know in fact that in 1636, which is how we know uh, when this drawing was likely made, he, he delivered this painting uh, to a patron and was paid for it because we're lucky enough to uh, actually um, know this from a notebook, from a sales kind of uh, account uh, book that has survived. And so we know exactly that he had, um, that he had painted this uh, painting, but the painting now is lost. And, and so what survive, um, what survives are just uh, these drawings of which the Corto has one. And you see here this sort of elderly figure of uh, Sisyphus uh, carrying this um, very heavy uh, rock uh, with his two hands. Quite an impossible task, I would say. I mean, I can't really imagine that it's that easy <laughs> to, to carry um, a block. Uh, of that size and probably weight, and he's curved um, by the yeah by the weight of this uh, rock and the fatigue that of course um, entailed this uh, really uh, hard uh, task. Uh, I'm showing you here uh, three more drawings related to this commission: uh, one in Windsor and a double-sided sheet, which is in Harlem, and um, where you see. Yeah, this changes. Um, he was thinking what the best uh, position for this figure would be, where the rock should be uh, placed. In the Corto drawing, uh, the figure was carrying it. Here you have it, uh, he's carrying it on his back. And then um, in the two drawings in black chalk at the far right, uh, he's actually uh, pushing um, them up as one of the texts. Uh, described the, the task of uh, Sisyphus uh, being that he is pushing the, uh, the rock up. And um, in the one at the left, which is in Windsor, um, the rock actually has sort of become, <laughs> has taken the shape of a large bag carrying, I don't know what, potatoes or, <laughs> or whatever. Um, and I did wonder uh, with this specific drawing whether uh, he had someone modeling for, for him, um, uh, pretending yeah, to, to be in that pose and carrying a real uh, bag. Um, though it is, um, yeah, it is uh, hard to ascertain this because he was then at this point of his career in his mid forties, quite an accomplished artist. And so to tell whether he was still using model or, or whether he was just um, sketching out of his uh, own imagination is, uh, is hard to tell. But what is um, fantastic, and I'm showing you here the sort of puzzle of the images all uh, together, is that um, throughout all these uh, papers, he was, um, yeah, thinking again uh, at how best to convey uh, the huge effort uh, that this poor guy was um, uh, forced to, to do, and also how to convey uh, this effort, how the, the limbs, how the legs, how the uh, arms should be positioned in order really to best deliver uh, the idea that his patron had asked him. Uh, I want a painting uh, representing uh, Sisyphus. And um, and Guercino goes from, from a young figure, like you see in the, in the two drawings in uh, black chalk, where, yes, it looks like more of a youthful uh, figure. Um, in one of the drawings, he has very short hair, then actually the hair becomes, uh, the hair is curly. 
and um, in the quarter drawing at the center and the one uh, at Windsor lower right, he, he becomes actually a much older man. Um, notice, for example, in the figure at the center, his uh, sagging um, skin around uh, the belly, uh, and also the much uh, elderly face, um, and um, and even the hair I find in in the corthal drawing uh, denotes really this yeah this fatigue this. Um, in huge effort that the that the person was uh, was under, but in all these drawing drawings, um, notice the numerous uh, pentimenti that uh, yeah that the artist uh, shows um, all these changes. For example, notice here. If first, um, do you see the cursor where I position it? Um, the leg was here before, and then actually he moved it to be to be here uh, with the hand as well. It sort of changes slightly the the position of uh, of the hand. Uh, so it does with this leg here, where a, just a single line denotes that hmm, maybe he was thinking the right leg should be positioned more, yeah, closer to the to the left leg. And, um, and my favorite date detail, which is this of the hand where you have two thumbs, where he was trying to think, mm, if I'm carrying this heavy uh, rock, this big rock, where actually would uh, the thumb be positioned? And um, I notice also, yes, the wonderful uh, changes uh, here, again, of the ink lines, where he's trying to, um, to convey the idea of a drapery that was uh, hiding the um, intimate parts of, uh, of the figure. The idea of, uh, um, of Sisyphus comes back also in another uh, composition that Guercino worked on, that of Atlas, another mythological figure who was condemned for the rest of his life to become uh, a mountain, the famous Atlas uh, Mountains in North, uh, North Africa, and by, whereby his uh, hair uh, would become uh, trees, um, actually. And, um, and you can sort of, yeah, by now get the idea of uh, Guercino's uh, changes and this sort of swift looping uh, moving lines that so characterize uh, so yeah, so well, these um, skilled, uh, skilled uh, draftsmen. And um, and I thought just to yeah uh, to show you this sort of patchwork, uh, bringing them all together so that you can sort of uh, see in one slide, um, yeah how how this artist was um, trying to to work out. Uh, in search for, for the best uh, solution. But um, this drawing doesn't sort of um, end here in the sense that he uh, can reveal a little bit more by um, turning uh, the sheet uh, on the other side. You, you would have sort of seen already from the image I showed you earlier that there was a handwriting. So the handwriting, um, the inscriptions are all at, uh, at the back actually of the sheet, but with time, they have sort of migrated to the other side of the sheet, which is uh, why you also see it in, on the recto. And this is a letter that his brother, um, Paolo Antonio wrote, where he was talking really of um, his brother's uh, success of a famous painting that had just been sold to a very famous uh, Roman cardinal. And, um, and it's just wonderful that these two uh, things have been uh, brought together and that they have uh, survived. And as Rachel was saying, um, they show the very common reuse of a uh, paper then. Um, intriguing, um, intriguing question remains, <laughs> did Guercino reuse his brother's uh, letter or did uh, um, his brother shamefully <laughs> use a drawing by Guercino to write this letter? Uh, so we'll never know, but um, but yes, uh, it's a wonderful drawing to to wonder uh, to sort of peruse and uh, and look at. And similar uh, numerous changes 
you will see in this drawing by Rubens. So we remain in the 17th century, but we move uh, north to the Flanders with this conversion of uh, soul. Um, for those not familiar with the um, biblical uh, story, um, it tells that uh, Saul, who was really a um, persecutor of the followers of Jesus, was riding to, to Damascus when suddenly um, a light uh, struck him from, uh, from the sky and he heard a voice and suddenly converted to uh, Christianity. And, um, and in this drawing, Rubens, who was uh, by then uh, a very accomplished artist, he had already uh, traveled to Italy, which was the uh, typical uh, trip that a, an artist would take in order to go and see the antiquities of Rome and the works of the Renaissance masters like Michelangelo and Raphael. Um, he had by, by this time, by 1610, 12, traveled back to the Flanders and was living in Antwerp when he was commissioned several religious paintings. And, um, and here he is yeah, thinking at uh, the composition um, for a conversion of soul. By then he has also specialized in these convoluted and multi-figure uh, paintings. Um, which really had become uh, his uh, speciality. And also his um, uh, speciality had become to uh, convey in these paintings um, extreme movement. And so this is what you, you see here. Um, you may sort of detect uh, Saul, he's at the center uh, here. He has fallen from uh, the horse he was riding. There is this figure here who is trying to uh, stop the horse who clearly was very um, um, worried because if he had seen the light and heard the voice, uh, he would have also sort of been scared by this, um, this event. And so he's sort of running, running away. And people have come to help uh, Saul who had fallen. And, and around him, all this multitude of, uh, of people on camels and horses um, suddenly realize that something yeah, big and important and something um, unnormal had, uh, had happened. At the back, you see a, a bridge and, uh, and here you see some, uh, some hills. And you also notice this line uh, here. It shows, it helps understanding that actually this drawing came from a sketchbook, sketchbook page, which at a certain point was taken apart, the sheets were sold uh, separately. And, um, and then we're later uh, reunited. And you can tell this because if you see here, there are sort of bits that are missing. And that would be because when the pages were uh, thrown in in the sketchbook, it would have been difficult for Rubens to get into that uh, middle uh, of, uh, of the sketchbook. But of course, now that they have been uh, reunited and they were reunited just like, um, 80 years ago, um, when, uh, when the collector who donated this work to the Courtauld uh, put them uh, together. And you can actually see it better here where a strip of paper has been added at the back in order to make uh, the sheet uh, more stable. The, in the case, unlike the Guercino drawing that I showed you earlier, uh, the Rubens work is actually um, related uh, uh, to a painting that in this case has survived and actually two paintings, both of which are at the Cortal, are in the Cortal collection. The one I'm showing you uh, at the left is a Noel sketch. And we think now that actually it most likely preceded the drawing. And so, whereas, the Renaissance tradition would be that first you start with a drawing and maybe you produce more drawings. Maybe first you start with the drawing single figures and then you bring uh, the entire composition on a sheet and then you move on to the canvas or to the fresco, to the panel, to um, paint. In this case, Rubens actually most likely 
went back to the sketchbook when he was unclear how to solve this composition. And in fact, um, if you compare it with the, with the drawing, you see that the sketch has um, a landscape that is much more, um, that it's close up. Uh, you barely see the sky a little bit uh, in the upper left uh, corner. There is no hint of, of a bridge. And, um, and the whole composition is much more restrained and focused at the center uh, with the figure of uh, soul here lying in the, in the foreground. But again, the scare, the horse uh, here and a sort of leaping uh, dog uh, here. The dog was also in the drawing, but was placed actually uh, further away uh, here. To, to, to talk more about changes, you can see uh, here that actually Rubens has um, laid down a piece of uh, paper uh, because probably he was unhappy with the earlier composition that he had drawn in that, in that area and unhappy with, um, with what he came uh, to, to draw in that precise uh, squared paper. He then added another piece of paper on top um, to again adjust the composition uh, accordingly. And in, in addition, he also added white body color, um, the one that Rachel was mentioning earlier on the Pontormo uh, drawing. And this was um, very often done by artists when they would uh, want to sort of draw over it. And this is what has happened here, uh, unhappy with the way he has positioned one of these uh, figures, he then added uh, some gouache, some white body color, and then drew over it in, um, in ink. Um, right now, it's quite hard to tell what the final solution he had in mind there, but it's quite interesting to see how, how he reused, how he changed, how he modified uh, really um, this, uh, this sheet of paper. And this is the final painting, which as I said, is also uh, in the Cortal collection. And, uh, and it's a marvelous uh, yeah, composition where he has clarified all these thoughts. And um, he has also moved the figure uh, of soul here. He has positioned the dog closer and everything is much more compact if you want here in the foreground. While in the back, all these scared horses and uh, horse riders uh, move, uh, move away from the central, uh, central scene. Um, but you see more clearly what was happening uh, in the sky, which was um, the event that supposedly had originated uh, the story. And I will now uh, rush to, um, and these are yeah the three uh, works all, all together. I will now rush to, to conclude quickly with, um, uh, with the, some images on a manuscript by Gauguin, uh, which the court all acquired last year through the uh, government in Lyon scheme, um, scheme that um, has allowed us yeah, to receive this, uh, this sketchbook, um, which is not very big, just um, the size of our A sheet, um, A4 sheet of uh, paper, and which contains um, a long text by Gauguin, uh, but including also drawings and monotypes, and also uh, prints by other artists in this case here, one Japanese print by Utagawa. And um, I will just briefly talk about this uh, wonderful monotype that is included in, the, in this volume, which shows uh, two uh, Marquesas. So the manuscript was in fact uh, written and, um, and created while uh, Gauguin was living in the Marquesas Islands in the island of Iba Oa, and was completed just a few months before he died in 1903. And so here he represented the two female figures of, um, yeah, of women that he would have seen regularly uh, on the island. But um, what is now, uh, what is uh, interesting to, to note is that um, he, um, he reworked this idea several times. And so uh, this was not unique, what I mean uh, of this uh, volume because the same figures 
return in a monotype, which you see here at the right in the National Gallery in Washington. And what you see here at the center is actually the drawing that is at the back uh, of this uh, monotype, which is uh, how it would have created the monotype in the first uh, place. And so you have the same um, figures, but reworked reworked and reversed with, of course, uh, a different uh, detail here that, than the one you see in the Courtauld uh, manuscript. And again, the same idea of the sort of very close up uh, figures coming in this other monotype in the Philadelphia Museum uh, of Art. And again, this is the drawing that is at the back, um, which is the first thing that it would have uh, done in order to create the monotype. And, um, and here we adapt here uh, the same uh, figurine, whether this was a sculpture or whether it was actually a figure by the door, it's difficult to, to say probably is, um, is a sculpture. I must say, I haven't searched this particular figure uh, yet. But um, you see, yeah, how he sort of readapts, changes um, ideas that he was uh, familiar with. And I conclude with this um, one, one wonderful um, three images. So the one I left is a drawing in the manuscript. Um, this is a watercolor, which is in another manuscript that exists, uh, which is earlier. You notice um, it was made at the end of the 19th century. And, um, and this is a watercolor in Chicago, where the idea of the seated uh, figure is readapted, but uh, heavily changed. And now I stop sharing. So interesting, thank you both. I was saying earlier how I have actually never seen most of those works that you've just shown, and I also didn't know they were in our collection, so it's really interesting to see that. And our works on paper collection is so expansive, and I feel like you just touched the surface today, and there'll obviously be a lot more to come when we do reopen on the 19th of November. Yeah. Before yep. <laughs> we sign off for the day, I have a question for you both, which is actually about the journey of how these works on paper came into our collection. So how did these drawings of artists kind of experimenting and testing their ideas actually end up in our collection? Would people collect them as much as finished works or did they come directly from the artists? I guess this is also quite euro specific as well to different. Yeah, so um, yeah, perhaps I can answer uh, this. So the Cortal collection is actually um, a collection of collections in the sense that we have predominantly acquired through donations, gifts, uh, yeah, bequests. And, um, and so collectors uh, in the 20th century were very generous and still in the 21st century have been very generous with the, with the Cortal and, um, and they have donated uh, sometimes their entire collections or part of their uh, collections. And um, but before them, uh, they were collectors basically since um, these drawings very often left the workshops. And, um, and, and we know this because most of these uh, sheets of uh, paper bear uh, the collector's marks. So um, in the past, it is still done today, but less so nowadays, um, collectors would create their own stamps, if you want, that they would then press or write um, on, on this sheet of papers. And so we know that throughout, yeah, the 16th, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, um, collectors uh, had them in their um, in their collections, then passed them on, and um, and some luckily have ended up yeah at the court. Room. And just um uh, just I mean, the um the Frederick Walker watercolor that I was um, speaking about um, at the end of my presentation that that's kind of the exception among the drawings that we show because it was actually. A, a finished work that was produced for exhibition, so it was it was shown at the Royal Academy um in the 19th century it was I, I believe it was purchased from the exhibition and um it ended up being given to us some years ago by a descendant of the person who purchased it so that's another way that um that these drawings enter the collection that's amazing thank you both so much it's really fascinating to hear that and i also think now that we know when we're going back into the gallery and be able to see these objects in real life once again, they'll have added value when we're talking and thinking about that. 
But I am sorry to say that's all we have time for. This event has been recorded and it will be on the Courtauld YouTube channel very soon, probably early next week. Now, I only have time to say thank you to Big Draw team for inviting us to take part again. Amber, Michelle, Helen, Ketty and Rachel for contributing and for everyone at home for taking part. Please do stay in touch and check out everything we have on at the Courtauld. It's a very busy time for us. And you can get your tickets for the reopening in November as well. Also, don't forget to send over your creations at Courtauld Res. I've seen quite a few coming in this morning. I'm absolutely loving it. As I said at the start, I never get a chance to actually make anything when we do this. So I'm living through everyone else's creations today. I hope um, to see you all very soon at another event or even maybe in the gallery. Bye everyone and I'll see you soon.